Let me show you how that's done. This is the kind of analysis that a comparative genomics expert would do. Uh, and uh, this is a rather small stretch of the genome, about 30,000 base pairs. So that's 0.001% of the total. And you're looking at a segment of DNA on chromosome 7. And across the top here is a diagram of what we knew before we started this in terms of what genes were there. And this happens to be a part of the gene which, when it's misspelled, causes cystic fibrosis. So CFTR is the name of the gene. This box right here is an exon, so that's a part that codes for protein. All the rest of what you see here is what we call intron. It's big spacer segments of DNA in between the protein coding regions, and CFTR has a lot of exons and introns, and some of the introns are pretty big. Now what you're looking at in the green boxes here is what happens if you take that same homologous region from another organism that contains also their version of CFTR, and you line it up with a human, and then you ask the computer to tell you how similar are they. And so the taller the green bar, the more similar they are, and you can see the chimpanzee, as I told you, is extremely similar all the way across, and that would be true no matter where you look in the genome. And gorillas and orangutans and baboons and macaques and vervets and marmosets are also very similar, but you are getting a little further away. You can see the similarities beginning to drop. When you get down uh, to about, say, the armadillo and a variety of other uh, mammals here, uh, then things get a bit spottier. And there's certainly regions where the computer can't really find a matchup at all. You have sort of blank areas here. And th but you can keep on going down to uh, possums and wallabies and platypuses and even birds and fish, tetraodon and fugu being fish. Then everything pretty much drops out. You'll notice, though, that there's one thing that stays there. <laughs> And the computer finds the exon just beautifully you know, when you have this kind of comparison. So that's the one thing that you can find when you go all the way down to fish, and that matches precisely with the protein coding part of this gene. But what about the rest? Is this just noise? I think your eye would have a pretty hard time picking out from the rest of that and saying, is there something here that's statistically significant? But the computer can do this quite nicely and will tell you, oh, no, this is not noise. Uh, there are clearly areas here that have been subjected to some kind of uh, constraint. And uh, here is one of them. And interestingly, knowing that, we went back and studied this gene a little more carefully and discovered, what do you know? There is an alternative exon in CFTR. For all the years we've studied this gene, nobody had noticed that. And, but when you have the sequence in front of you, by this comparison, you know to go look for it. It is. And I'm not sure what it does, but it's probably important because it seems to have been in some way conserved down through a long period of time. And then you can find some other places, like over here, the computer says there's something really interesting. By the way, this blue track is sort of the computer summary, uh, which can be calculated with all the sequence in front of you. So we studied that one a bit more, and it turns out when you look at evidence of a functional uh, sequence, one that regulates gene expression, tells this gene when to turn on or off, there's a very important one right there, a signature. And we didn't know that, really, before having this information, and the computer sequence uh, helped us see that. And uh, then there are these others that are still waiting to be figured out. Uh, that are highly significant statistically, but are still in search of a function. And this is a typical region. And as I said, about a third of what this analysis tells you turns out to be the exons, the code for protein, and the other two-thirds is like, wow, I didn't know about that. And that has opened up a whole area of really fascinating research uh, for people to work on. Obviously, this has really significant consequences in terms of what we think about evolution, and I'll come back to that. You can build, by the way, an evolutionary tree solely based on the sequences, and that's what it looks like from all those organisms, not just from the cystic fibrosis region, but lots of other regions as well. And this is what uh, the computer tells you is the most likely, the most parsimonious tree of relatedness of all these organisms. And interestingly, that's exactly the tree that people who have studied anatomy and people who have studied the fossil record have come up with. There are no real discrepancies here. So, this does bring us to evolution, which is where I want to dwell for a little bit. Obviously, this has been an area of enormous contentiousness and caused, I think, considerable distress on the part of believers since uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, published in 1859. And it almost seems to me as if the distress is getting worse, uh, despite all the decades that have passed uh, since that theory was originally put forward. If I was the one who was designing uh, the way the experiments would come out, I'm not sure I would tell them to come out the way they have, but the data is the data. And so I want to share with you what the data points to as far as the evidence uh, for the relatedness of species from a common ancestor 
And that evidence, I will tell you, uh, really points, really without any ability to deny it, uh, to the fact that we humans are also part of that. And I know that is not a conclusion that many believers are comfortable with. But I think, again, if we are searching for God's truth, we need to see what God's truth tells us. First of all, the fossil record certainly is consistent with Darwin's theory. I'm not an expert on the fossil record. I would point out, though, that for those that have pointed to this as an incomplete demonstration of evolution, that many of the gaps that have frequently been referred to in certain uh, publications are rapidly being filled. We have filled more gaps in the fossil record in the last 10 years uh, than in any of the t uh, times before that, and including uh, something like this, which is a very interesting find uh, just reported a few months ago of an organism which uh, had its fossil uh, dug out of an outcropping almost uh, in the Arctic Circle. Uh, which uh, clearly shows an interesting anatomy, uh, that is, of something that looks a bit like a fish but has already developed the ability uh, to be able to move around on land. And if that was one of the things that people said we'd not seen an example of, uh, here it is. But what I'm more knowledgeable about is the study of DNA. So, obviously, when we see those similarities of DNA between different organisms, there are two possible conclusions. If you believe in multiple acts of special creation, that God created all of these organisms as individual events, but used the same successful motifs over and over again, then you could end up with DNA sequences that look similar uh, between organisms and could, and could include ourselves. So similarity alone doesn't address the question of common ancestry versus special creation, or as some would say, gradual creation versus special creation. But when you look at the details, it becomes difficult, I think, to continue to sustain those two options as equally likely. And there are some examples, there are many, but I'll just cite a short list. Uh, one that we now know a lot about because it was part of sequencing is human chromosome 2. When you look at the chromosomes, which you can see under the microscope of a human, there are 46 of them, they come in pairs. Chromosome 2, you have two of those. When you compare our chromosomes with that of a chimpanzee or a gorilla, they look a lot alike. In fact, they look stunningly alike, with one exception, and that is chimps and gorillas seem to have an extra pair. And when you look at human chromosome 2, it doesn't seem to have something that looks like that in chimp and gorilla. Instead, chimp and gorilla have two other chromosomes that are smaller. So how does that work? Well, now we have the sequences. It's pretty clear to see how these things are all related. Turns out, human chromosome 2, uh, which is shown schematically here with the banding pattern that you can see under the microscope, has this anatomy. And here are those two extra chromosomes that the chimpanzee has. And in fact, just by looking at the banding patterns, people were able to say some time ago that what was extremely likely to have happened is that sometime uh, in uh, a previous ancestor, these two chromosomes had joined head to head in order to generate a single chromosome that looked like that. Well, now we have much more detailed evidence than just looking at it under the microscope because we have the sequence and we can look. And these colored uh, balls basically tell you what kinds of sequences you find in these chimp chromosomes and in the merged place in the human. And I say merged because when you look at the sequence, that's inescapable. There are sequences present in this part of the chimp that you would not normally find in the middle of a, of a chromosome. And you don't find in the middle of any other chromosome, but you find them in chromosome two. And they are not functional sequences. They are repetitive sequences that mark things like centromeres and telomeres. And so this gives you a signature, a footprint, if you will, at the DNA level of what apparently was a chromosome fusion. All of the other primates have the chimp version. Human have the exception. And so the conclusion from looking at that is almost inescapably uh, that we are descended from a common primate ancestor, but that fusion occurred somewhere on the branch uh, that gave rise to, to Homo sapiens. 